Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Can you all hear me? Shumam Abarit. Shumam Abarit. Okay, great. Um, you know, before I begin, uh, this is a, a quick question, admin sort of question for uh, Shadia. I'm curious, would, would, would you and others present here feel comfortable if I made this more of a discussion? So first to Shadia. Um, so like, um, that's perfectly fine by me. Um, I don't know. I think I'm not sure. But we'll see. We can see how it goes. Okay. All right. Inshallah. Inshallah. Let's do that. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد جمع مبارك to you all I'm really happy once again to be with the Muslim space community um, as some of you may, may be aware uh, as some of you may be aware, uh, this, we are in the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. Um, the first spring is how it gets translated, and it is the lunar month uh, in which um, um, historians, scholars uh, have come to the conclusion that the Prophet وسلم, was born in this month. Um, so all across the Muslim world, uh, you will see uh, in many places get festive around the season. Um, and of course, some of you may be aware that the celebration of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, can sometimes become a contentious issue as well, an issue of communities to differ on. Um, that's not really what I want to focus on today, um, but I want to use this month as a reminder um, for us to all connect ourselves to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the final prophet and messenger who uh, we believe has come with the final revelation for all of humanity um, and who is described by Allah Ta'ala in the Quran as Rahmatan uh, lil uh, a mercy for all of the worlds, um, all of the cosmos. Um, and using this month as a way to revive that connection by just uh, simply reconnecting with some of his seerah, reconnecting with seerah being his um, biographical narrative, um, or reconnecting with some of his narrations. So that's sort of what I had in mind for today's session. Um, and I wanted to briefly just start I'm not going to make this, uh, it's not going to be exhaustive, obviously, but this is just more for encouragement for everyone here to, to try to perhaps find some time to read a seerah. And this can be done anytime during the year. If you're busy at this uh, time in the year, it doesn't matter. But it could be a good sort of motivation for folks to pick up a seerah book. Um, so the one I have is actually uh, Revelation, um, and it is written by... Uh, uh, Miraj Muhyiddin, Miraj Muhyiddin, and this is a great, uh, this is a great book. It has illustration. It's very detailed. Um, provides um, kind of the story through the lens of some of the major biographies that have, uh, in the English language, especially, uh, he draws upon, as well as uh, that which uh, has been written in Arabic as well. He draws on uh, some authors, diverse authors. So I really, I really appreciate the way he's done this book. So let me just share, you know, some of the initial background and backdrop of, of the Prophet Sallallahu But before I do that, you know, in, in kind of what I had wanted to experiment with is to see how, um, whether we could make this more of a discussion. So, you know, would anybody like to share perhaps what they recall from, uh, you know, Anything that leads up to the birth of the Prophet وسلم, stories you've heard, or um, anything that um, uh, you know of his childhood. So we're talking about before uh, revelation, before uh, Allah Ta'ala begins revealing the Quran to him through um, Hazrat uh, Jibra'il salam. So before that. So like I, I can start it off. So you just want to know just what like how familiar we are, what's our favorite 
Yeah, like just a story, just a like a story that you've connected with uh, uh, around like either the birth or what leads up to the birth or sort of the childhood of the Prophet ﷺ. Anything that sticks out, just briefly. Um, I listened to a really fantastic series of lectures on the the um, sort of the humanistic elements of the Prophet ﷺ. And one of my favorite things was when uh, the professor, the, the sheikh was describing just how um, kind of the the manner, the attitude that the prophet had as a, as a child, that he was uh, very melancholy, that he mm -hmm. wasn't like very aggressive. Like a lot of the boys would compete with like wrestling and fighting, and that really wasn't his his manner. It really mm -hmm. wasn't his interest, and just how he almost had a sense of being aloof at times, and maybe a bit of a daydreamer. But I just mm -hmm. the, the term melancholy always sticks out uh, mm -hmm. because I feel like. No one ever talks about how the the being an orphan at such a young age would have affected him. And so yeah. it just makes me feel like thinking him of him as a small child and being melancholy um, mm. makes me just kind of enhance that that love I have for him. Mm. I really appreciate that, Shavia. Thank you so much for sharing that reflection. Assalamu alaikum. I have something to say here. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. We all know, and I'm sure this is nothing new that I'm saying that uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, was involved in humanitarian activities before he was told by Almighty Allah that he was the Prophet of Allah at the age of 40. So he was involved helping poor... The but needy. brother, your voice is really um, low. Uh, do you, is there any way to move closer to the mic maybe or... All right. Is it better now? It is. It is, yes. Okay. So he was involved as a young man in helping the needy, the sick, uh, the, the wayfarer. Uh, he was very much involved in humanitarian activities, even before he was appointed uh, at the age of 40 as a prophet of Allah Almighty. So this mm -hmm. is something that didn't come to him when he became prophet. He was, right. he was doing these things a whole lot before he became a prophet. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And would anybody, uh, perhaps someone that hasn't shared yet, be willing to share what they recall from, you know, who his parents were and the story of how he actually gets orphaned? Tabriz, I can call on you maybe because I've had uh, conversations with you before. <laughs> Uh, thanks. I'm I'm probably going to be learning from others here, so I'm listening along. But uh, I appreciate uh, the confidence and um, <laughs> learn. Okay, no problem. Yeah. So you know, let me share a few things with you, and then you know, if folks have you know like a comment as I'm reading or sharing, uh, or kind of a question comes up, please just uh, feel free to speak up on mute. So. We know that the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ was Abdul Muttalib, um, and he was a uh, representative of the Banu Hashim clan, which is the clan that the Prophet ﷺ belongs to. And um, uh, his son, Abdul Muttalib's son, uh, and the Prophet's father's name was Abdullah, and he uh, was married to Amina bint Wahab, who was the mother of the Prophet of the uh, And we, we know that uh, it was the fact that um, Abdullah, the Prophet's father, وسلم, fell seriously ill in Yathrib. Yathrib was the um, name for Medina be before it became, you know, the city you know medina just translates in arabic as city but it became sort of the city the city of the prophet وسلم, but before that it was called yathrib um so it said that abdullah uh, fell seriously ill in yathrib uh and died shortly thereafter and he was uh in the midst of a trading expedition to syria so they were traveling north you know towards syria um and on the way home, they say that he 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 stops at Yathrib and he gets sick and he dies. And this is a period uh, back in Mecca that news eventually reaches the mother of the Prophet and she's bearing a child. So she's 
pregnant with the Prophet وسلم, and she hears this uh, traumatic news uh, and and um, you know is probably quite devastated you know because she was newly married as well um, I'm sorry if you could excuse me just for a second my children are actually really acting up I apologize Excuse me for that interruption. Um, uh, but they say when it comes, we were at the juncture when the, the father of the Prophet ﷺ passes due to illness and uh, his mother is at home uh, and she's pregnant with the Prophet and she was probably devastated. But what we hear is even during the pregnancy of the Prophet ﷺ, when she's pregnant with the Prophet, she has, uh, she hears a voice telling her to name the child Muhammad. Um, so the name is kind of coming from the unseen. And um, there's also some reports that she gets uh, a kind of light that expands from her belly. And uh, she has this vision of seeing um, the palaces of Sham, which is like modern day Syria, Palestine, Jordan area. And maybe a little bit more, but um, that was a kind of foreboding folks said of sort of the uh, where Islam would reach. Um, but you know, this was uh, some of the things that were related. So, um, so we talked a little bit about the early childhood of the Prophet, um, just in terms of his melancholy. But uh, it said that you know I kind of want to go into the details of of the age and such so um we also know do you, does anybody here recall how uh what happens to the prophet وسلم, when he's born does he stay with his mother or does he go somewhere else or is given to another family for a time i think there's a wet nurse who takes care of him halima Yes, Halima. Yes, Halima Saida. And uh, does anybody kind of know a little bit of the details about why the Arabs did this? Why this practice existed? So, uh, yeah, I think uh, Shadi was going to. This isn't fair. I don't want to take all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so my understanding is that um, as they became more sedentary in a, a sort of a city-like setting, they yeah. felt as though they were losing some of that um, that knowledge of of living in the desert, of uh, adapting and and understanding the desert. And so they would send the children off to these Bedouin tribes so that they could be nursed and also get that experience, that desert life experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As things got more cosmopolitan. Uh, and urbanized the they felt that there was something missing that there was something pure about desert life and they wanted to instill those things in the children um does it you know one thing i'll share that you know um may not be as familiar but were you aware or is anybody aware of sort of what the what were the economics behind um giving a child like this to what did the tribes uh that were the wet nurse, you know, tribes that the wet nurses belong to, what were they gaining um, by offering the service? Has anybody heard of that at all? Okay. Um, so basically uh, what they say is that um, the, by becoming sort of, um, a wet nurse for uh, you know tribes in Mecca, 
they there was a so, sort of connection uh, that was forged between that you know kind of clan or tribe or family and that of the Meccan family. So what these uh, families in the more kind of isolated desert areas wanted was the economic advantage of being linked to such a family uh, of wealth. Um, but in the Prophet Sallallahu case, um, many families um, did not, you know, families weren't really taking him in particular because um, he was an orphan and they knew that the family couldn't, you know, wouldn't provide them as much of an economic advantage. So uh, many turned down uh, Amina's request uh, or a kind of um, search for finding a wet nurse for her son. Many turned it down. But, uh, you know, Halima bint Abi Duhayb um, and her husband, they are the ones who eventually end up um, taking in the Prophet ﷺ and raising him at that early stage. Um, and they say they were from the poorest of their clan. Um, so they were also desperate, you know, and they did, may not have immediately done this, but eventually, you know, they say in some reports that, uh, you know, uh, in a report or some reports, it's been, it's come to us that basically, um, it's sort of uh, Halima thinks like, okay, you know, we're not finding anyone else right now. Why don't we just do this uh, fees of Bidullah or like, you know, as a good cause, you know, so she happens to take him on out of this uh, pure intention, they say. Um, and so Halima and Harith, her husband, raised Muhammad as their own son, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they would regularly return to Mecca to let uh, the mother, Amina, see her son's progress. Um, there's also this miraculous event that occurs uh, that occurs while the prophet is under Halima's care. Uh, and so it's said that she comes and tells Amina about this incident. Um, and the incident as follows, two men in white clothes came to me with a golden basin. Uh, sorry, this is the prophet, peace be upon him, narrating this incident. Two men in white clothes came to me with a golden basin full of snow. They took me and split open my body. Then they took my heart and split it open and took out from it a black clot, which they flung away. Then they washed my heart and my body with that snow until they made them pure. So this is an incident that occurs that kind of, you know, maybe troubles Halima and she does tell Amina and eventually Amina, you know, takes, you know, takes uh, the prophet uh, into her care again. Um, so this was at around the time that he is four years old. They say that at the age of six, the Prophet وسلم, travels to Yathrib, uh, again to Medina with his mother, um, to visit their Khazraji relatives. And it's during this trip um, that, you know, they say that he learned, you know, he met with his relatives at that early age. He learned how to swim and to fly kites. You know, I thought that was kind of cool to, to know. You know, so next time you're swimming or flying a kite, you can remember the Prophet Sallallahu at his, you know, six-year-old phase. Um, but unfortunately, you know, you can imagine like a kid getting to know his relatives and, you know, playing with his cousins to an extent. And then suddenly um, his mother falls ill, you know, and severely ill to the point where she also passes away in this town on their return journey in this town called Abwa. So now he's been orphaned twice, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, at, and now we're at the age, age six, and then his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, who I mentioned earlier, kind of takes over care for him. Um, there's more, there's more to say, you know, and the story continues, uh, but, you know, his grandfather also passes away, um, and that's two years after his mom has passed away. So now we're looking at age eight years old, you know? So if you all have kids, you can kind of try to reflect on like, what is the psychology of a child at these different ages? And of course we know that the prophet is a human being, but he's also a kind of special creation at the same time, you know? But uh, so there's an exceptional component to what's going on, but at the same time, it, it can be helpful to connect to the prophet to kind of 
reflect on and imagine where he, you know, how a child may handle these different tragedies at, at you know, these ages. So where at age eight, he loses his grandfather. Um, and then he's put in um, the custody of Abu Talib, who is his um, father's full brother, full blood brother, Abu Talib. And so because his clan, the Banu Hashim clan, was not as it was not doing so well economically. Being an orphan at this early age also meant that you know he still had some responsibilities and he had to play his role in sort of supporting the family in a certain sense. So uh, he was shepherding sheep, you know, around the hills of Mecca. They say as well at this early age, and he was fond of that as well. So he would shepherd these sheep. Um, and that was also a part of what he had to do belonging to the family that he did that needed uh, everybody to kind of pitch in. So let me stop with sort of the Sira introduction here. You know, there's always more to say. Um, yeah, you all have any thoughts and questions, reflections even on what I've shared? Yes, I have um, a comment here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this incident that you narrated, uh, um, uh, two people wearing those grow, uh, gold bracelets came and uh, opened the Holy Prophet's chest, uh, opened it up and washed his heart. Uh, this has been uh, disputed by many uh, learned scholars because mm -hmm. they said it makes one assume that God forbid he wasn't born pure. But he was pure from the time from the you know from time, time immemorial. God made him pure and and park and uh, very clean from the very beginning. So he didn't need to have his heart uh, washed and uh, so forth. So that we, I think we should note that that is the point of uh, dispute here. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jazakallah. Anyone else? There's a lot of stories that I've read about. I've also read about stories with the relationship with Ali. Hans, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. There's a little bit of background noise, but your voice is also kind of fading. I'm sorry. You might have to speak a little louder, but I, I'll try my best. There was a story, I don't know exactly the date, but it was a relationship between Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his friend Ali. And once Ali passed, a lot of uh, Muslims started to follow Ali's message since he was a very close friend of Muhammad. But it started a war in which they overthrew Ali and his family. And of course, uh, when the prophet peace be upon him traveled to Medina and seen that the Jews were fasting, so they began to fast. Those are the, the stories that I, I reconcile a lot. I caused some of that. I, I think you're referring to events that happened later in the life, uh, after the life of the prophet wasallam. So this gets into the time of the fourth Khalifa al Rashidun. Uh, according to Sunni tradition, and we have Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, and during Ali's reign, there is a lot of civil strife, uh, but it's also sort of building up throughout history. I didn't know if that, you know, uh, I couldn't hear all of it, but I hope others heard it, and if there's a question in there, you can also type it um, in the uh, chat box, because I had a hard time following. Um, let me let me kind of uh, you know just a quick note. This is my own comment on what I shared from the Sira is that you know what Shadia you mentioned about the um, melancholy sort of description of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, I I certainly was reflecting on how his period when he's shepherding the sheep on sort of the outskirts of Mecca or the hills of Mecca, like what that feeling must have been like, you know, just time slowing down and you're really sitting with yourself and sort of reflecting and kind of, you know, developing perhaps, you know, you, you mentioned daydreaming and wandering a little bit, but 
you know, someone that develops an attention to, to their internal world, you know, and has the sort of environment set up to actually engage in self-reflection um, and deepen it. So I, yeah, just from an early age, it seems like he probably was someone who, who had that quality. So let me, uh, I think we have about five minutes left. So let me recite to you all uh, some narrations of the Prophet. Probably we'll only do one narration of the Prophet so long, so long, given, given the time that we have. Um, but, you know, it's one that I think most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, it's part of the a famous collection by Imam al-Nawawi, who was a famous scholar, and uh, he collected uh, a compilation of hadith, 40 hadith, al-Arba'in uh, al-Nawawiya, they, they call it. So his, his collection um, has... Um, yeah, it's a very powerful collection. I recommend you you go through it when you have time. It's on sunnah.com. But here's here's the here's the narration. An Abi Hamzata Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu khadimi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama an al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama qal la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi rawahu al-Bukhari wal Muslim. Um, this translates as on the authority of Abu uh, Hamza Anas ibn Malik uh, anhu, who was a companion and also served domestically in the house of the Prophet وسلم, he narrates that the Prophet says none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself and of course the implication is brother, sister you know all our um, all, all, all members of our community. Um, so none of you truly believes uh, until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. So maybe we could just reflect a little bit of, uh, about this narration together. It's an oft-repeated narration. But, you know, maybe y'all can share a little bit of what you think. How do you think this would apply? You know, how does this apply? What are the cha challenges to implementing something like this? Um, it kind of reminds me of like when I think like sometimes we have an instinct to think like, for example, if we see someone who's unhoused, we think like, oh, you know, like they would appreciate anything, you know, like I have some food left over, like I'm sure they would love that it's better than anything. Or like, you know, if you give them a, a small shack to live in, like it's better than sleeping on the road or like that kind of like I thinking of assuming that we know what somebody deserves or like, yeah, that kind of thinking where it's like we wouldn't want those same conditions would it be maybe enough for us, but um, we can get caught up in like a power structure or like a thinking that we expect we expect more for ourselves and expect less for others. Um, and I think, you know, that's something to work on. Yeah, yeah, it's like a very, very kind of powerful comment, really. Yeah. Can I call on someone? Uh, Sima, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, maybe. Shema. Shema, thank you for correcting me. Yeah, no problem. Um, do you have any reflections on this narration? No, not really. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how about Roshanara? Uh, yeah. not, nothing much. I just was reminded of the golden rule. Like, do not do to others what um, and the, and the vice versa of it don't like mm -hmm. do for others what you would want them to do for you mm -hmm. so. yeah 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 thank you for that yeah the golden rule is like it's a uh, it's really common you know it, it's like an age-old wisdom but I think as um Irene was pointing out it's not very easy to implement it it's not always easy to really inculcate that attitude um, but, you know, what's kind of fascinating for me in this hadith is 
the Prophet وسلم, is really saying that true belief, this is what it looks like. You know, true belief, you know, if you aspire to true belief and if you really want to follow me and if you really want to embody Iman and what that means, uh, that's what it does to you. That's how it transforms you is that there is this sense of um, going beyond oneself or uh, the sense of putting uh, the rights and the circumstances uh, and our concerns um, for another person in our community to be at the same level as our own concerns for ourselves. And I feel like living in a very hyper individualized kind of society where it's very difficult to even inculcate that spirit. You know, um, sometimes, you know, I feel like I've caught glimpses of it when I've traveled to the Muslim world. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, the Muslim world doesn't have its problems, but sometimes you can kind of feel this like cultural current seeping through from the past to the present where you feel like there, you know, amongst some of the people, there is this sense of deep sense of concern for others. Um, and sometimes the networks are a little bit stronger in terms of family. Again, I'm not trying to idealize the Muslim world. I know there's a lot of problems, but sometimes you get a gist of that. So yeah, I really, I really appreciate it. I think it's something that we really need to implement down to our, you know, mosque boards, how they operate with the imams, how we do community service and service to others, how we make people even feel when, you know, we have the upper hand. I feel like all of this goes into this narration of, you know, how do you want to receive? If you were in that situation of circumstance of, of need, what would be the adab or adab, the mannerisms with which you want, would want to receive it? How would you want to be given that? You know, uh, and really putting our hearts in in other people's shoes. Um, very challenging, but, you know, may Allah give us all tawfiq and allow us to do that. Inshallah, I'll, I'll conclude here. إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب oh Allah we ask you to bless us to forgive us for all of our shortcomings we ask you to overlook them we ask you to bless our children and guide them we ask you to bless our elders we ask you to benefit all those يا رب العالمين that have benefited us on our journeys to you and we ask, Ya Rabbil Alameen, you for love of, of your messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your final prophet, um, the mercy for all of humanity, and that you make us a community that is able to embody that mercy for the rest of humanity and to be witnesses for the rest of humanity for what it means to be a Muslim, submitting to you wholly, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, with that statement. Bi rahmatika, Ya Rahman Rahimin, Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen.